Welcome to CCS. My name is Chris Rees. I'm the honor of chairing this August Society. Our speaker this afternoon is Jürgen Müller. Welcome, Jürgen. Uh, he started his computing career when he was still at school, uh, programming an Apple II, uh, and then went on to study physics. His professional focus has been the development of instruments and software for science, like science research. And his hobby is vintage computers, as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jürgen is going to talk to us this afternoon about Tiny Ace, um, minimalist concept <clears throat> of the pilot Ace, um, amazing machine, which knew only one operation. He tells us data transfer from a source to a destination address. Mm -hmm. Fascinated to hear about it. Jürgen, over to you. Sorry, one, one point I was supposed to mention, particularly for those online, questions are welcome, but not during the tech, during the talk. At the end, please. And if you want to ask a question, please type it into the chat and Roger will read it out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much for having me and giving me the ability to talk about a new project of mine. Mm -hmm. That is an important disclaimer up front. I, I, as a hobby, I don't claim to be the ultimate scholar on this. There's mm -hmm. bound to be gaps. There's bound to be things mm -hmm. that are wrong. Please do feel free to, to bring them up, correct them, add important information, but we will cover some slack. Um, let's see, can we clean up this? Please mm -hmm. go slide. All right. Yeah, so the idea is I want to talk a bit about the original pilot ACE, a computer on Ethereum designed, and what part of the team, at least during the early days of building that. Um, not so much about the history, just very brief context, a bit more about the architecture of that computer, which when I learned about it, I found that so fascinating, it's so different from the days. I want to explore that a bit further try to get a better feel for it. So I decided to go on my own, build a small model, a scaled down, simplified model with somewhat more modern components, tractable at, at home. Um, and that's the second part of the talk. I wanna show you a bit what I did there. And uh, Then in the end, we can have a quick hands-on look at the tiny ace. I, I brought that here. Um, and of course, uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, so let's start with the original pilot ACE, which uh, is short for automatic computing engine. We'll, we'll get into that. That's a reference to Babbage actually, analytical engine. Mm -hmm. um, a computer which was actually designed by Alan Turing. Um, obviously everybody here will know Turing. Um, certainly everybody in the general public knows him, obviously in the UK where he is on the 50 pound note now. Uh, also in the rest of the world, I think, with at least with the with the launch of the uh, imitation game movie a few years ago, his role in code breaking uh, in the Second World War has, has become very, very well known. Um, the first uh, work he made a name for himself was in computing, in a way, but in a an abstract theoretical uh, general purpose computer he designed, which was not, not meant to be built yet but uh, was a, an experiment, a thought experiment uh, to reach conclusions about general computability, what, what problems are addressable by a computer. Um, the Turing machine, actually some of the technical concepts did find their way into the actual physical automatic computing engine later on. During his time at Bletchley Park and the heartbreaking uh, efforts there, he did learn about actual technology components which can be used to make real physical computer. Mechanical uh, devices in the, the bomb uh, machines, uh, modern well based fast electronic designs in the Colossus. Those were not general purpose computers, but they used the same technology components. And then in a way, after the, uh, after the war, he took on a mandate at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington where he had the opportunity to bring both these worlds together, 
the experience with general purpose universal computers and the actual implementation technologies. And uh, he was uh, put in charge of designing one of the first and one of the fastest uh, general purpose computers. That's what we want to focus on here. Uh, he stayed in the computing field after that. Um, actually, he moved away from the automatic computing engine effort relatively early before it was completed. With additions, maybe, building onto the competition in Manchester, where a computer was actually finished earlier than the automatic computing engine. Um, and of course, he continued with work not only on that uh, Manchester Mark One system, but also in a very broad scope, thought about uh, first artificial intelligence concepts in a way, right? What would it take for a computer to be considered intelligent? How would we test that and how um, that? And one of his late works, mathematical biology, uh, modeling morphogenesis in, in biological evolution. So covering a really broad scope, but kind of in the center of that, certainly chronologically, uh, he was in charge of one of the first universal computer designs. Um, a bit of historical context. This was at a period when every computer was still a research project. Um, every computer was built just as a one-off. Um, this is not a complete um, map of computers of the time. Um, shows some, some representative uh, families of, of computers which were designed. It highlights that a very broad range of different technologies was still being explored. And the actual computation mechanical components were still used, mainly by two in Germany, his own uh, tradition and, and family of computers. Um, relays definitely were a viable option, valves if you wanted something as fast as possible. Different storage technologies were being explored. Storage was one of the, the biggest problems uh, at the time, and we'll get into that. Um, and also, it was kind of a, a race between bit serial and parallel architectures. Uh, both were, were in use at the time. Yeah, and the little squares, uh, the white ones, indicate that most of the computers really were one-offs at the time. And only a few years later, the first of these research designs were translated into series products. The, the very first one being the London Mark One, on the Manchester Mark One in the um, UK. So that's that's the space where we are. All right. Okay, so that's where we are, and the pilot aid is shown right in the middle there. Some heritage, which I'll also briefly mention later in the talk, uh, it did also make its way into commercial computers. Some very immediate uh, siblings and, and some more you know, different cousins. Um, so let's talk a bit about the design the technology of the, of the pilot A. Uh, pilot A is being a small scale <coughs> test model which was designed based on the more general base concept. What, what Turing had in mind from the start was a big machine used for central computing services. Uh, wisely, they chose to start implementing a small test bed first, which turned out to be so useful that it, it, it kept being used for real computations for, for quite a few years. Uh, you, you'll see that. Um, yeah, memory was the starting point of Turing's design considerations as well. And it was the key problem uh, at the time. How do you store data quickly, especially if what you want is a von Neumann type architecture where you need relatively large amounts of storage because your program should be in the memory and your data, and it all should be accessible fast if you want a fast computer. Um, how do we approach this? Kind of uh, starting with a blank sheet, you, you make a table, you, you list all your options, you, you list a, make a scorecard essentially, right? What, what are the options? Where are the pros and cons? And that's what Turing did. This is from the original design proposal. Okay. 
Oh. <laughs> You listed all the technology options and ranked them by monetary economy. How many digits can you get per pound? Uh, space economy, how many digits can you fit into a liter? And then access times uh, and, and throughput reading and writing memory. And if you look down the leftmost column, it's a really broad range of options he looked at. But really taking a step back, looking at all the possible options from hardwired connections which have really great read speed, but the writing speed is darn slow. Uh, you did include the human brain there, the cerebral uh, is, is, is there, uh, which is great regarding spatial economy and monetary economy. There are someone's salary and what he can remember uh, for that money. Access times are actually not that great, so well, the perfect choice. Um, well, Turing preferred were two options. Uh, perfect delay lines, which we'll talk about in quite a bit of detail because that's what got chosen, and uh, storage tubes, which were a brand new idea at the time, using a picture tube and writing a pattern of dots and, and reading it electronically, which actually he preferred and which came out best in this ranking. Eventually, the team shied away from that and went to be a safer option with. Uh, the um, quick look at the options under consideration. Um, classical flip flops were definitely known and available. That's what we use today, right? For memory, um, static SRAM memory, flip flop for a bit. Um, the vacuum tube valves had been available for a while, the flip flop was known. Um, you could actually fit one flip-flop into a single physical valve because dual triode val uh, valves were available. So not a totally unrealistic. This was used uh, for machines which had registers to store a handful of uh, numbers to work on. Um, but then for the program, large amounts of data tables, etc., these were not really a viable option because the number of things uh, went Unmanageable proportion of equipment. Um, so, this the design of the Neumann architecture, this was not an option here. The um, William Kilburn tube, um, which eventually made its debut in the, in the Maniac uh, system, as mentioned, came out best. It, it's a pretty smart, already random access memory where you can address dots. Uh, write a bright spot into the phosphor and then read the electron emissions uh, via another electrode which you place in front of your screen. Um, but eventually it was deemed, uh, yeah, too, too early days, too risky. Let's, let's not do that. Let's back on acoustic delay line memory, which had the big advantage of being derived from a technology that was already known at the time. So it looked like a safer bet. Turned out to be more difficult to pull off. And, uh, um, the delay lines were known from radar technology. Um, essentially, it's the tube filled with mercury, uh, which has desirable acoustic properties. A speaker on one end, microphone on the opposite end, and you send a train of pulses through the tube, which travels through in the order of a millisecond or so. You pick it up again at the other end, and then you have your input signal delayed by that time, which you can scale by the length of the tube. In radar technology, that was used to get rid of stationary echoes. Um, you send out a burst of electromagnetic uh, waves. You get echoes from various distances at different times. Most of those echoes never change because there's a building in the way, a mountain a bit further away, whatever. You're not interested in those. You want to see the approaching aircraft, for example. Um, so to make life easier, what you would like to do is to subtract out all the stationary signals. And the way that was invented during the war to do that was send the signal through a delay line. You have periodic pulses. You send them out every millisecond or so and come back. Um, and then you have a delay line which has that same time delay. So 
at the output of the delay line, you have the previous signal that has come back. You can subtract that from the more recent one, and then all the same signals cancel out. That's what we want. That was no. So the idea was, okay, we just need to close the loop and this becomes a memory. If we pick up the output signals at the end of the tube from the microphone, amplify and reshape them a bit to become proper digital bits of, again, and send them back in on the input side, um, there's a memory. We've got this train of pulses and just use amplitude modulation to encode a series of ones and zeros this way. And it keeps traveling around and it's stored in there. Um, of course, one important thing missing, you want a way to write into this delay line. So you also need to provide a little switch at the input where you can select, should it recircle what's coming out from the end? Or do I want to write something new into the delay line? And you need to be able to control this with precise timing so that you can <coughs> target individual bits, individual words in the delay line as they travel around, as they pass by, just at the right time. You switch to I want to write something new, and you do that, and then you switch it back, and it keeps recirculating the information. That's the idea. Um, and that's what seemed like a relatively manageable effort because the fundamental technology was known. Um, Turned out it wasn't quite as, as uh, easy in the end. Um, you've got decent packaging density, as Turing already estimated in his table up front. Um, in practice, what was used were tubes about one and a half meters long, which gives you, with the heat of sound in mercury, about a millisecond of travel time. And then if you start with a bit clock of one megahertz, that's what Turing Kind of based on a gut feel, I think, claimed from the start. Let's design this computer assuming a clock speed of one megahertz. That seems still tractable. And on the other hand, we want it fast, of course. Um, so that was a, a given. Um, yeah, then one millisecond gives you about a thousand or 1024 if you want to keep it nice and binary bits, which you can keep circulating in there. That's a picture not from the not, not of the ACE delay lines, uh, because I didn't find any. Presumably because they always resided away somewhere in a well-insulated, temperature-controlled uh, enclosure, because the travel time, of course, is temperature-dependent. Um, this is from uh, the EDSEC project in, in Cambridge, which used the same approach technology-wise. But yeah, you can see about the same scale, about a meter and a half long. That's roughly what they need as well. Um, yeah, you need to control the temperature precisely. You need, if you want multiple of those tubes for bigger storage capacity to all tune them to exactly the same travel time, of course. Uh, so it's it's a finicky technology. And it did end up taking about three years of the development time, the eight years of the project, to get the memory. Um, plan, the original plan for the big full-scale A's was we need 200 of those. Uh, <laughs> they started with 10 in the planet A's. Um, when eventually the big ACE was built, it didn't get 200 tubes, but 20 some, because by the time the epic sound memory had become another option, was bigger and slower storage. So nobody ever built something with 200. But they did get it to work. So uh, it turned out to be a viable option, although a more difficult one to achieve. Once you have the memory, you kind of design your computer around that. And again, Turing had his, his personal view on this and said, look, the Americans, they just throw hardware at the problem, right? And uh, we'll do this a bit differently. We'll apply a bit more thought, uh, which meant thought both in the design process and later on for the programmer, as we'll see. Uh, it's, it's not the easiest to program architecture eventually, but it was a totally viable priority to set at the time, which not only meant yeah. the cost in hardware, but also much better reliability. If you can get away with 700 tubes instead of 5,000, which were the eventual numbers, uh, that's that's a big gain. Um, um, one obvious thing to do, if you have this acoustic delay line memory where the bits <laughs> travel around serially, it kind of pushes you to also design a bit serial architecture. Right? The, the bits come by one by one, Part of your delay line. This is an image with yeah the, the numbers actually used in the in the ACE architecture. Thirty two words, thirty two bits each. 
were what was circulating in there. And yeah, you conveniently place them with the low bit first um, so that you can do arithmetics on the numbers mm -hmm. as they come out of the delay line bit by bit. Um, it's also it's kind of obvious idea to also add some short delay lines, uh, which can be your working registers. Um, you, if you want an accumulator or a couple of them, you don't really want them parallel as a register of flip-flops because all your data come by sequentially anyway. So let's make shorter tubes uh, or a, word, a single word each, which is available in each word cycle of the machine. And then you can add simple operations like a single bit adder with parry, which I have conveniently omitted here. And that's all it takes to add a word from that delay line to the accumulator, for example. Um, so that's the, the basic idea, which kind of lends itself once you have the serial sequential memory, um, which already gives you a big simplification, right? You don't need a 32-bit adder, but very naturally you get by with a single bit adder. Turing um, then took this further to the next level of What's the instruction set? How do we control this machine? Control instructions, etc. cetera. Um, by concluding, we actually only need one instruction. Um, transferring data from source to destination is, is all we need. Um, so this is a block diagram, not of the full machine, but of, of the typical components. So that hopefully still remains somewhat visible. Um, you'll see the long delay lines there, just as we saw them with uh, switches, in, in this case, data travel from right to left. So the input switches, which select whether data should circulate or new data are written on the right-hand side, and they come out on the left. And you'll see short delay lines down here with a couple of extras, which I'll get to in a minute. And, and these are all grouped together by one big multiplexer on the left, which selects what source address you want to read from, and another big multiplexer on the right, which selects what destination address do you want to write to. Those together, which back then was not called a bus, but a highway. So that's your data highway. Um, that's the fundamental architecture, just a set of storage units, which can be the source of data and the destination of data and two big multiplexers to select from what source do the data come, which destination should they go to. Um, which, of course, begs the question, so how do you get any meaningful operation, right? You can move data around, but what else? Um, there was no central arithmetic logic unit, but uh, the technology to do arithmetics logical operations was distributed across the working register. If we look at the short tanks again here, the short memory, uh, you see that um, this one, for example, short delay line number 26, you can read this right away via one of the source selectors. You can also read the same output going through a, an inverting uh, unit, a negator. There's another switch which selects that output. Um, in the same way, other logical operations were available, which would tie two delay lines together do an AND or um, and allow you to read that under yet another source address. And on the other hand, you can play with the input to the delay lines. PS16, there is a way to write data to it directly, but there's also an adder subtractor unit. And under a different address, you can reach that same destination, but add the word to it or subtract from it. Um, and in that way, uh, all the typically known operations uh, logical and arithmetic were available, um, including multiplication in, in hardware. Um, and in a slightly tricky way, which we can get to later, also branching was possible, of course. This was a universal computer, so you could branch depending on whether the number was zero or um, Another simplification from the hardware perspective, uh, there was no program counter in the system. Uh, none was needed because every instruction carried the information where to go next in the instruction itself. Every instruction had its own go-to implemented. 
which was done that way, not so much to save the program counter hardware, but to allow the programmer to optimize better. Um, because the whole architecture was not random access. It's, it's not a random access memory, right? You have to wait until the right data word comes around or until the next instruction comes around in your delay line. Um, and if you are smart and arrange your data and instructions properly in the delay line, that is not a long wait, but it will come around relatively soon. If you're dumb and uh, just scatter your data in whatever random way how things come about, uh, it might mean waiting for more or less a full circle, mm -hmm. which doesn't take forever, um, but it gets noticeable, right? At one millisecond uh, full circle time for 32 words to pop by. You, you don't want to do that too often. So you better be smart and arrange your data properly. Uh, and this implicit go-to operation in every instruction allowed you to do that. It's a timing field which would which select where is the next instruction supposed to come from. Yeah, the effort did pay off. Uh, 800 tubes is, is what they ended up uh, using. Yeah, the projects at the time had a few thousand, three thousand to five thousand. So it, it certainly was uh, the, the most compact architecture from a hardware perspective. Oh, didn't mention the uh, program decoding unit here. This was a von Neumann arch uh, architecture. So the data highway uh, let the data circulate, but there were also um, there was a separate instruction highway tied to the same long yeah. line. So those long 32 word delay lines could also source the instructions and by a separate bus into a instruction decoding unit, um, which is, let's, let's not get into too much detail here, which did decode some of the information and held it statically. You needed to know where the next instruction comes from, where the current source and destination addresses are, and you needed to control your multiplexers. That information needed to be all over static registers. So there were few flip flops there to hold that. And then there was part of the instruction which kept circulating in the uh, in a counter, in a ring counter, and which had timing information. Uh, keep track of which of the words in my roundabout delay line do I mean? Which do I read and transfer to a destination? When does the next instruction come, uh, come along? And there were these countdown fields which were part of every instruction. Um, yeah, let's look at the instruction format in a bit more detail. Maybe that's the more interesting view here. Um, so this was a three address architecture. Um, Every instruction had a source and a destination for data. And it also gave the delay line where the next instruction was supposed to come from. It was a shorter field, only, only three bits to encode the next instruction here because only a subset of the delay lines could be used for that. Um, but that was not all you needed. You also needed to keep the timing in mind. So there were two timing fields, a wait and a time field. Um, and the main purpose was one of them gave the timing. When does the data transfer happen? How many word times do I need to wait before the data transfer happens? And the other one gave the information, when does the next instruction get fetched? How many word cycles after the data transfer and that happens? Um, all relative timing addresses to make things interesting. Uh, there was no absolute time in, in these delay lines of 32 words each. You couldn't say this is word zero because that would be defined randomly when you loaded your program. Uh, all the timing from instruction to data transfer to next instruction was relative. So and so many words later, which works. Uh, I still find it a bit unsettling when trying to write a program, but uh, you, you get used to it, I guess. Uh, they also had a clever way of giving these timing fields an extra functionality where you could set a single bit, this uh, serial flag here in your instruction, and then the data transfer did not only happen once when the wait time was reached, but it kept getting repeated until the next instruction, the instruction was to be fetched. Putting some constraints around how you can arrange your instructions, but uh, this was pretty powerful. So with a single instruction, you could, for example, copy a whole delay line of 32 words to another delay. 
or with a single repeated add instruction, you could add a whole vector of numbers. Or you could do a barrel shift and, and shift n, n bits at a time um, with, uh, with these uh, long operations, all achieved by a single bit in the instruction set and essentially a single flip flop. So, really nice example of the smarts and all step. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you program for that uh, architecture with, with a bit of thought? Um, mm -hmm. It was a two-step process mainly. You started with preliminary coding shown in an example on the, on the left. This calculates successive squares. Um, first, you just wrote down a sequence of source to destination transfers and probably comments to the right of it to keep track of what you were doing there. And control transfers were just indicated graphically, um, loops and, and jumps. Um, that's relatively easy to do. I still need a cheat sheet when doing this. Uh, there's a list of sources and destinations on the right. Uh, they're all just numbered, and it's not very obvious what destination has what number. But you can address all the long delay lines. You can address the short temporary storage tanks, and then there are these special addresses where you can add to certain registers or where you can read not directly the register content, but it's inverse or the register content shifted left or right by a bit. Um, yeah, with that in mind or as a cheat sheet next to you, you can pretty easily write down the preliminary code, but you're not done then, of course. Mm -hmm. Now you need to think about how to arrange things in memory and how to uh, optimize your timing. Uh, Detailed coding or what was called optimum coding, trying to minimize the wait time. Uh, that's a bit like juggling. <laughs> Keep many things in the air and, and try to make ends make ends meet. So you took that preliminary program and expanded that. Um, the first destination column is still there, but you also need to figure out what's the next delay line the next instruction comes from. And then how do you need to set your timing fields and in which minor cycle and in which relative word cycle should the next instruction be? So you, you struggled a bit and, and try to, to place the instructions in the right time slots to have them available as quickly as possible. In the same um, to actually drive the machine, you had a control panel, which at first glance looks not unlike panels uh, of, of later machines ever to the PDP series, right? You, you had switches to set bits and you had lights to read bits. Um, actually, some nice convenience features here. There was a, a board hand set of switches. If there was a particular word which you needed often, you could preset that. <coughs> Uh, with, with a single uh, push of a button. Um, carries of lights to see what the encoded word was and what the output from the machine was at the time. A large amount of the real estate on the front panel was actually for debugging. And that's both debugging programs and debugging the hardware, as you would expect with this being a research project. And this is really um, so there's a lot of switches to of open the loop, uh, which this whole program execution is. Simply, it's a closed loop control system. Um, if something doesn't work, it totally falls apart. It's, it's not easy to debug, as I learned with my replica. Um, so there are, for example, switches where you can open the loop and force certain addresses to be selected and force certain inputs to be pushed into destination addresses. Um, to allow you to observe those effects one by one, which when I looked at that initially studying the, the design, I thought, how is that supposed to help you with debugging your programs? It's not probably. It was meant to help you debug the machine, which they don't have kind of. Uh, there's an oscilloscope up here behind this uh, shade where you can see the contents of one delay line, pattern of 32 by 32 dots. So one word. <laughs> And my personal favorite, there's a phone dial here. It also was a debugging feature that was to send a defined number of single step pulses. 
debugging a loop, for example, you know it takes eight cycles. You want to see the next iteration. You can, of course, put the single step button eight times. That gets old. So you can also dial in eight. And then uh, you oh. get. Uh, you um, I think that's largely what I had on the. What did people do with this when when Turing first published his white paper? Um, he has a pretty wide net. He, he uh, took a very broad view of what can digital computers do. Obviously, a lot of typical math applications, matrix based, iteration based optimizations. Um, he did discuss two applications and to limit what this machine was good for and what it shouldn't be good for. Two applications. Uh, where he thought, this is not what we want to do here. Uh, one, because we can't do it so well, integrating areas under curves, we lack the input uh, functionality to get that into the machine. And the other one, number eight, because our machine is, is too good for that. Uh, yes, we do have punched card equipment, which was used for input and output, uh, commercial punched card devices. Uh, let's not use this machine to sort and filter data. They are simpler electromechanical devices, which can do that, would be ways to use the uh, phase architecture for that. And he also thought beyond uh, classical numerical math, we can use this to solve puzzles. We can use this to play chess. Um, so even at in late 45, when he wrote that initial design paper, what ended up being the killer application is linear algebra solving large uh, systems of strong equations. And a lot of serious work was done on that machine. Uh, it, it, it provide computing services to industry and academia for <laughs> um, really foundational work on numerical algorithms it was done by the team leader and continued to work. They did have kind of a high level language, even the general interpretive program was kind of a table controlled way of uh, describing a sequence of uh, matrix and vector operations, very concise and compact definition, because that was such a frequent uh, application. It paid off to, to simplify that and um, save you from having to hard code it in uh, assembly language, essentially. Um, yeah, turned out to be really useful for quite a few years. Um, and it was essentially only decommissioned when the commercial version of the design <clears throat> became available. So the legacy, um, the full size A's was eventually built. A beautiful room for the equipment shown in the upper right. Um, it was it's um, it's well, kept in use for, for quite a few years, as you can see. But very early on, started to be outpaced by newer computer designs. Uh, ferrite core memory came to the scene, random access, no mechanical parts, fast, etc. So um, then full size ACE didn't have a huge impact historically. Uh, in the interim, uh, English Electric made a commercial version of the ACE that used very similar to the oscilloscopes and the phone dial. It's, it was all put into the uh, commercial version as well. Um, and uh, 33 units is the number I found were built. The more distant cousin plays uh, became much, much more popular. Um, Harry Hinton was a member of the ACE team for a year as a visiting scientist, went back to the US professorship. <laughs> and he took a mandate to design a small self contained kind of personal computer, which ended up being the Bendix G15. Used magnetic drum memory instead of the mercury delay lines, uh, but otherwise was very similar to the ACE, the inspector set for the network. Um, and that one uh, sold uh, about 400 units. So, way of coding uh, did become somewhat popular. So. All right, I don't need to tell anybody here, right? The real pilot ACE is still around, not far from here in the science museum. Uh, you can't use it, it's, it's not working. The delay line memory is not installed, and I'm not sure whether it's hidden in storage somewhere or whether it's lost at some point. Uh, but certainly, 
<laughs> the main panel with the 800 tubes and the beautiful control panel still there. Okay, let me be a bit briefer on my uh, attempt to build my own little functional model for you at home. As I said, when, when I learned about this uh, design, I thought hey, I want to play with that a bit more. I want to explore that a bit more. Um, specifically, I wanted real ultrasonic delay line memory because that was kind of the most unusual aspect of that design. I had done some old computer designs replicating them in FPGAs uh, before, but I wanted to make it a bit more tangible with this very nice and simple clock diagram, which, which we looked at earlier. Well, it should be possible to really arrange components in a way to make that clock diagram visible on the, on the circuit board. So let's use this pre logic. I obviously did want this to be a bit serial design with the only source to destination transfer operation and, and the functional sources and destinations to be And I was prepared to accept some compromises, uh, knowing that my memory size would be smaller than in the real pilot A's that drove shorter word lines to make them fit into the and hence limiting the number of addressable sources and destinations. Um, what did I use for memory? I started with that, like Turing did in a way, because that seemed like the, the most difficult one. Um, there's a, a nice way of doing that with uh, delay lines used in televisions in the 1970s and 80s. The PAL color uh, transmission scheme, phase alternating line, inverts the phase of the color information every other line um, to, to compensate against drifts uh, on the transmission path. Um, avoiding this this color shift which NTSC has which is why it's sometimes called never the same color <laughs> uh, in order to encode that signal you again need uh, the most recent line and the one before and you want to take the difference of the color information in those two so a similar challenge as with the radar uh, technology and a similar solution let's use a delay line and an open loop configuration past the line of picture information through, and then we have that pair of And since a lot of color TVs were produced, this was optimized a lot, uh, mainly driven by Philips. Um, those delay lines are really small, size of a stamp. Um, mm -hmm. There's not much in there. There's a glass plate in there with two of the corners cut off to accommodate little piezo speakers and microphones. And as indicated on the leftmost side of the bottom, uh, the beam path, the, 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 the wave path is folded multiple times. The wave bounces around the edges several times. There are these black dots of dampening material on top of that little glass plate um, to kind of constrain the acoustic waves to the path they are supposed to take. And then after going around three times about 10 meter, uh, 20 centimeter distance, comes out of the alleged and that makes it quite usable for, for my purposes. Um, some constraints which were given by the television standard, the color uh, signal I had about a four and a half megahertz frequency, and the duration of a picture line is about uh, 64 microseconds. When they specify the delay lines at 63.943, they mean that. Uh, mm -hmm. They are amazingly good. I was concerned initially, hey, I want more than one in the system. Will they all have the same delay? Do I need to tune them somehow? What about temperature stability? They're good. They're specified to plus minus five nanoseconds. They are better than that in practice mm -hmm. in travel time. You can blast them with a hair dryer and nothing changes. Uh, it's uh, quite good. So on that call, I got an easier deal than the original pilot ACE team mm -hmm. to fill with this much more, I'm sure. Um, it does take a bit of tweaking. Let's not talk about that too much. Essentially, to fit a decent number of bits in there, um, 320 turned out to be a plausible number. You want a power of two as the number of words. And then 20 bit words ended up fitting my instruction set nicely. Essentially, I need a five megahertz carrier wave, which I need to modulate at every single period. The one bit is an amplitude, 
a non zero ambiguity for one cycle and a zero bit is would be quiet for one cycle. The glass doesn't really like that. If you set it off oscillating, it wants to keep oscillating. So the first zero after a series of ones, you need to stop it actively. The negative pulse are used to drive that and, and quiet it down. And then also it doesn't really want to start oscillating again after a period of quietness. So with the first one after a series of zeros, it needs an extra nudge, a higher amplitude. Uh, but that's all it takes. So you, you need to remember the most, the, the previous bit state uh, and encode that in the way you drive this play line. And then it does what it, what it needs to do here. Um, I combined that since I was looking at 1970s, 80s technologies anyway, uh, with 74 series logic, 70s, 80s, which I thought was a, a good compromise in being discrete enough to allow me to lay out the board in a way which is similar to the plot diagram we saw. So you can see here the long delay lines, obviously. I cheated with the short delay lines. I didn't find acoustic components which had the right travel time for a single word length. So these are shift measures that are fitting the one, which are much easier to use. They, they just take your yeah, and then there's big multiplexers on both sides and the bus, the highway going around on top. There's the uh, control to drive your instruction decoders. And there's a control panel, which we can look at in a bit more detail. Um, yeah, and as mentioned, I, I did have to omit a few things. Uh, the word length of 20 means I can't address 32 sources and destinations, but only 16 each because the bit fields need to be smaller. So I uh, simplify that. Um, how do you do the logic design for that old machine? Where, where do you where do you find out what what to do? How it actually worked? Um, there were diagrams, schematics available at just the right level of abstraction. Um, I'm not aware of anything on a tube level. Well, maybe it exists somewhere, but uh, I, I couldn't find that. But that's not what I wanted anyway, because I want to do the more modern bit lock and the gates. Um, and in the progress reports from the project, they have described the full computer design using this level of essentially logic gates, which were drawn in somewhat unusual ways. Um, so the upper left, that's a uh, gate which sends out a pulse if at least n inputs are set. But it turns out in practice, they Pretty much only use this with n equals two, uh, which means it's an AND gate. Uh, both, both need to be set to get an output. The um, wooden version with uh, inhibiting input. Delay lines feature a lot, of course, in those schematics because there was a small element with the number of bits indicated there. Yeah, using those elements, uh, the, the bottom uh, shows a full long delay line with the Selection switch on the input side. Do I want to write new data from the highway or should it recycle information? Um, and that level was pretty convenient to translate that into modern schematics uh, and use modern DL logic. If these look vaguely familiar, you might have seen them here, right? Uh, <laughs> 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 see not all that rich. Those schematics were used uh, in the background. Just, uh, See, and it obviously has the final days uh, photograph shown there. Um, so uh, yeah, I spent I spent some time this morning looking for a bank which would give me a nice. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. um, so that information was available and, and quite accessible. Um, it does get a bit. You need to dig into it, think about it a bit more. This is a full. Adder with carry, which which can add or subtract. Um, somewhere in here, there's a one bit delay um, here for the uh, for the uh, carry. That's where the memory is to take that over into the next bit cycle. Yeah, and otherwise there's a typical things, some of which are even more what we did there, right? There were and or gates, for example, already in use in those diagrams. Um, one more 
on the one hand to scare you a bit, it, it gets it gets messy. On the other hand, to show that again, how elegant and simple this design was. This is the complete execution control, which decodes functions, which uh, adheres to the timing of when does the next data transfer and, and uh, word access happen. Um, that's all it takes. There's um, this is this ring counter I mentioned earlier, a one word delay line where the instruction keeps cycling around. And every time this weight and timing field comes through, it gets run through a subtractor uh, to count it down. Uh, and if uh, it passes zero, that's the time to technically do the data transfer or to actually fetch the instruction. Keep track of where we are in this cycle of data transfer, getting next instruction, et cetera. There was a small state machine here just a handful of flip-flops. Essentially, every one of these ovals here is an RS flip-flop um, that keeps track of the whole cycle of the machine. It's executing instruction fetch the next one. Um, and this one, I, I love this. This is all it takes to implement conditional branches. So there's one more flip-flop here. Um, and what you could do is Either test whether the next data word is equal to zero or not, or whether it's negative or not. And depending on the output of that, this flip-flop would be set. Um, and that would influence the execution state machine here in a way where if that condition is met, it doesn't fetch the next instruction which you have specified in your code, and it gets that and fetches the instruction afterwards, which seems like a very limited way of branching. But since um, since every instruction has a build and go to anyway, it you, you had full flexibility, right? You you could still do everything you need. Um, yeah, beautifully simple way of, of doing that. Um, yeah, and again, it translates nicely into. Um, You know, look at the front panel of the real ACE. Uh, that's the corresponding one for the uh, funny ACE. Um, yeah, as you would expect, a row of switches to enter your numbers uh, manually from the writing console, which is not how it was used in practice uh, for real calculations. Um, there's a uh, punch card reader and the real machine and, and my little replacement for that, which is essentially wired in parallel with the input switches and you could use to read a whole set of numbers or, or data input from a stack of cards. And likewise, there is a row of lamps to read a result, but wired in parallel with that, uh, you could activate a card punch to uh, store your, your results and then that numbers of the results automatically. And again, the majority of the uh, panel is dedicated to that functionality. I've replicated pretty much all of it. Uh, it was great when I started to think about, it. okay, how do I make this debuggable? If, if I build this, there's bound to be errors. Where do I need to have sort of jumpers to be able to, to influence this? Eventually, I realized, hey, it's already there. Everything is already in that design. They have had the exact same thoughts and, and solutions. There are switches for that. Um, it, was, it was pretty cool. One of the benefits I kind of hope to get from this uh, experimental archaeology of the planets. Let's uh, try and get a bit into the heads of the original designers. Uh, some extended work, I would say. Um, yeah, one, one nice benefit is that you can see directly on the how the instructions are set up. The individual fields uh, of an instruction directly are reflected. Well, I should mention that the low bit is on the left for whatever reason. I, I've not found any source for that. Uh, obviously, they knew how to write out numbers, and it was in every number system more common to have the low digits on the right. They're on the left here. Uh, Everyone that goes first through the middle. Yeah. 
probably for some historical reason, the way of the data flow was set. Um, all right. Um, I think that's where we could switch to a brief demo of the of the real thing. And then for those in the room, of course, we, we can have a, a look later. Um, all right, with that, I wanted to acknowledge uh, resources which have been made available in the original documents. The key ones are all in the Turing archive now. Convenient for hobbyists from Germany to, to access those. Uh, there obviously is a lot of good sec uh, secondary literature, and I'm highlighting just here. And uh, many thanks to Rainer Klaschek from the Forum, who was very, very helpful in the initial discussions, actually suggested using these. Uh, <laughs> Um, and yeah, we went back and forth a long time figuring out how to what's the right level of simplification to make this feasible in the, in the small scale and still retain the features. Mm -hmm. All right, let's spend a couple minutes. So can I check? This is your interpretation of the ACE using modern technology. Yeah. So in a way, it's a bit like playing bark on the piano rather than bark on the harp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, it's it's a compromise, right? It it doesn't aim to be anywhere near what's done in the National Museum of Computing, where you really replicate the original designs with the original technology at the full scale. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's meant to be reproducible for others. Uh, I still haven't gotten around to fully covering the thematics, but that's that's the plan. Um, yeah, and that's what drove this compromise. And it seems kind of right. If I replicate a 1940s design in the 2020s, 1980s technology is kind of in the middle. So, <laughs> all right, there is a way to switch to a camera here. And I think what I need to do is stop the sharing. The trick. Not quite. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to terminate the zoom. Let me escape. Yeah, maybe escape will do it. It's not perfect resolution. We discussed a bit whether we want to annoy you by bed. Spatial resolution or by bad time resolution. Um, oh, I think that's the. <laughs> Take the oh. lights out, which will help. Right. If we could dim the lights a bit, because my LEDs, turns out my, my uh, tinkering table light at home is not that brightly illuminated. Which, which, which one is this? That one. That will do. That's it. Okay. Switch this thing on. Um, yeah, so that's my, my little model. You saw photographs of it. Um, essentially a single board computer, um, about the size of a Kim, if, if you were into those very early computers. Um, yeah, you can immediately see the delay lines up here, right? I've got three of them here. Um, and then the short delay lines in, uh, Chip registers uh, the LICs down here. Um, you see that prompt, yeah. Oh. Um, and they're all held together in the block diagram we saw by a big multiplexer here, which was called the source tree uh, back then, going around up here <clears throat> along the highway and back down to another multiplexer, the destination tree, where on the program control, you select where to send the next data. Um, there's a little piggyback board, which, which might strike the eye. That's essentially a quartz crystal oscillator. Um, it needs to come at a very odd frequency. With, <laughs> with the delay lines, the time, the travel time is, is set by the glass delay line. The number of bits is set. I want 320 in there. Uh, so you end up with a really awkward uh, clock frequency. It's not five megahertz, but four point nine six two or something. Is the, or can an old television set will do it for you? 
No, I actually shifted that a bit. I, I'm running these slightly outside of the resonance frequency mm -hmm. to make that even number of bits fit in. Uh, so this could be a quartz oscillator at some point. I'll probably get a custom one made, but this is a, a little circuit board with a programmable PLL oscillator. It's slightly embarrassing because it's configured by a microcontroller, which has more computing power than <laughs> Uh, which is why I kept it on a on a little breakout board to be able to actually remove it, hopefully. Um, yeah, and then the control panel, we, we briefly talked about that, and it was probably easier seen there. Let um, me see the whole thing. Shift that up a bit. Yeah, maybe that's better. Huh? Um, yeah, so row of switches, row of lights, um, a lot of real estate for the, um, for the debugging. We, we can look at a couple. Um, and the little oscilloscope, which at the moment doesn't display much because it's all zeros. We will see that in a moment. Um, referrals. Um, I did want the telephone dial, but it was a bit large for the scale of the little replica. So that's a separate unit sitting next to it. And this is my replacement for the punch card reader. Uh, I'll show that in a bit. Uh, this, this reads uh, optical pseudo punched cards. Uh, it's a row of, of uh, photo sensors, which reads one word one word at a time, and has a shift register to serialize that information and push it into the machine, just like a uh, set of switch settings would be read. We'll, we'll see that in a bit. Um, yeah, how do you get information into that machine? Uh, you have the switches, but you can't use them in the same way you would in one of the early PDP computers or such, set an address, set a data word, trigger and, and write it in there um, because you don't have control over the timing from, from, your, from your front panel here, right? I, I have no way to send it exactly to this word in the, in the cycle. Um, that can only be done under program control. So you need to boot the machine up uh, with, with a boot sequence um, right away. The meaningful things you can do from the front panel is write to the short registers where every word is the same, or write the same word to all the um, uh, all the words in the, in the destination. You could do that briefly. Um, as mentioned, there's a lot of debug functionality, so I can activate an external tree control here, which lets me. Um, select sources and destinations via this extra row of switches. And it's already looking at source number zero, which happens to be the row of input switches. And now I can also set it to destination number one and set a continuous transfer. Yeah, and then you can, can you make that out in the, in the picture? Maybe it's a bit difficult, right? So in the oscilloscope, we, the oscilloscope, we now see the contents of delay line number one, and it has in every line and every time position of the delay line the exact same pattern, which is the pattern I set via the input switches here. So on that level, it behaves as you would expect. You, you can control a word and send that to some destination, but you can't control the timing you, you out from the machine right away. You need to boot that up. Uh, they think that through right from the start, even in the assignment of addresses there, when you, when you fire up the machine, everything is set to zero, right? There's no waves traveling in the delay lines. Everything comes up at zero. There also is a reset switch here, the clear store switch, which sets it back to all zeros. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, and they smartly arrange the addresses in a way where your row of input switches or your punched card input would be address number zero as a source. So when it boots up the first instruction it already has and its instruction register is reading something from source number zero from your from your input device. And destination address number zero is the instruction instruction register itself. You can write directly into that as a shortcut that's mainly used for booting. They have something to get things off the ground. And then they designed a really clever sequence describing which takes two pages, two pages in the original uh, progress report. Uh, 
And it took me a couple of hours to read and understand those two pages at first. They only need three instructions to fill a holy ley line with information from the punch card stack. Um, and this auto repeat, this, this block operation figures prominently there. One of these instructions is one which fills the whole delay line with 16 or the original 32 copies of an instruction which says, replace myself with what is read from the, um, from the input device. And in that way, you, you send that, you initialize your whole delay line, and then it overrides itself step by step. That works, and that even works in this machine. Let's, let's maybe do that. Uh, Quickly, you, you will read a slightly down on the picture. So let's see. The reader. The, the reader is um, also. Yeah, 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 that's probably better. Okay. Um, so let me do that very slowly. That's probably best. I, I clear the floor so everything is reset to zero. And then I need to activate the reader. There's a dedicated control switch where you can activate the well what and the original was the punch card reader and activate that instead of this row of switches so it's still used uh, it's still read under address number zero but that now will read what comes from me um, and essentially after every byte uh, after every word that gets read uh, and, and serialized this uh, reader also sends a single step command Say, okay, this word is now ready, process it, and then the next instruction kicks in. Um, when I push this through very slowly, you should see, yep, mm -hmm. there's that first instruction kicking in, which fills the whole delay line with that interim mm -hmm. instruction. Replace myself. And then if I keep pushing, you can see that it replaces everything. I now continue to push. There's room for the other two delay lines on the card, but they're not used. Um, and that's us done. And we should now, if I didn't wiggle too much, have a program in the memory, which is the one I showed as an example earlier, the um, successive squares calculation. Um, so that does take a handful of instructions. Uh, yeah, fills about one delay line, as, as you see there. Um, these, by the way, are, are just PowerPoint templates. So the, the kind of clear text mm -hmm. is here in form of numbers, and then it gets converted into, let's say PowerPoint, it's Excel, Excel templates. Why do you convert that into black and white squares? Which was my way of uh, not having a paper part of the reader. I don't have a punch either, and I don't have a hardware device to replace the paper card punch, but there is an option to connect a uh, computer terminal via USB instead which isn't quite as real as the hardware solution. Um, every instruction also can control whether it should just run and the next instruction automatically gets fetched or whether there should be a wait after the instruction. Um, and that's used a lot in communicating with the IO devices or playing something and letting the user look at it before the uh, operation continues. Essentially, there's a stop flag in every instruction. And then on the other hand, you can force the stop flag by switching the machine to single step mode. And there's a, a single step button here called one shot. Then, and in this case, with this program, every time I press one shot, it calculates the next successive square number. So the mm -hmm. first one was a one, next one is a four, this one's a nine, mm -hmm. and then the one on the left hand side, and one plus eight, and 16, et cetera. So it, it keeps stepping through. Um, yeah, as mentioned, if I activate the stop button here, now every click of one shot uh, creates a single step. Um, if I'm lazy and I want to define number of single steps, I can dial that here and it steps through a couple of times. <laughs> or they also had a kind of a, a slow motion mode back then. Uh, you pull the one shot the other direction, it steps at about 10 Hertz, which, which we did at well. well. So um, yeah, as, as mentioned, a lot of effort went into making this friendly to debug because a lot of time must have gone into that. Um, I think we're over time already, so I'll probably stop here. Um, I 
have a couple of other things I could show here if we want to have uh, a closer look later, but I'll stop at this point and I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> Um, are there questions in the room people would like to ask? Chris? Uh, I'm reading Doran Swade's book about um, cabbage at the moment. One of the issues he faced was going from addition and subtraction to multiplication and particularly division. Would you say a little about how that was managed in ACE? Yeah, the, the original colored ACE already has dedicated hardware multiplier, which uh, was a bit limited, it would only handle positive numbers, um, but it did, did that autonomously. You, you set this off and it did its thing in the background via a little separate state machine. And apparently they had programs which made use of that feature to have the main machine prepare the next set of numbers in the foreground, normalize them, deal with the signs, etc., while the multiplier was busy in the background with the previous uh, operation. So that was in there in hardware. Division was fully in, in software, so that uh, was a much more costly operation. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't quite get. I, I can see the input. You explained it. How, how do you get the output? What? How do you read the results? Hmm. So there's this line of lights, which is connected in the background to a shift register, right? Uh, real data is circulating through. So there was what they called a staticizer, and its counterpart, a serializer, to convert between serials format. And um, this staticizer, which took, which was reachable as one destination, so you sh shifted a word of data in there, and it captured those, and then it could either show them on the lights, or it could send them out to the card punch device. And that's what was used at scale. And which was used quite heavily. They, they did use it, uh, both the card punch and reader, work on very large matrices for the high end of the, of the complexity there, about 50 by 50 um, element matrices. Interim intermediate results were stored on punched card stacks which was a few orders of magnitude slower than, uh, than internal memory, of course, uh, but still many orders of magnitude faster than doing all these calculations manually. So you would have one run and then move the hard stack forward to the leader again and then process the next iteration. I got a question from Andrew Herbert. Andrew, uh, would you like to ask your question? Need to unmute, I think, Andrew. <laughs> oh. uh, Andrew, I see Andrew, but he's, he's working with the EdSac rebuild. Yes. I'll still unmute. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what the problem is, Andrew. Doesn't seem to be a the host has blocked the host has blocked unmuting. Yeah. Oh, um, who is the host today? <laughs> well, the co-host is is Dan. Do I need to do something. Can you unmute? Mm. Yes, can you stop blocking unmuting? Well, I, I can read Andrew's question. Yeah. Perhaps. Uh, um, the question that um, uh, Andrew's asking is, how did the slow mode work? If you slow the central clock, uh, yeah. it, it, sorry, uh, <laughs> having a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that question makes yeah. sense. But, but that, yeah. Very good point. You can never slow or even stop the central clock, right? Everything collapses mm -hmm. immediately. All the ultrasound data are lost. The clock always keeps ticking whether in single step mode or in this uh, slow-mo mode, the main clock always goes at full speed. And it's just in this mode where at the end of executing an instruction, <laughs> even if the time has come to do the next instruction, it doesn't fetch that, but it waits until an explicit, okay, go 
one shot signal has been received. Mm -hmm. And you can either send single ones via that single one shot button, or you can send a few via the phone dial, or there was a separate slow oscillator, just an RC oscillator at 10 Hertz or so um, to send slow single pulses. Uh, but there was always a lot of active waiting and cycling the um, low lines over and over again until the next time allowed the Great, thank you. Uh, just in terms, you've I'm sure you've delved uh, quite deep into uh, like conceptual design, and you've replicated it completely into the tiny eggs. Have you any thoughts of maybe perhaps simplifying the design, knowing what we know now, or um, sort of maybe perhaps compromising on the logic gates? I, I certainly don't see ways to make it any simpler. Um, there are obvious ways to make it a bit more stable and then easier to build. And I used some of those. Uh, the original design didn't really use a central clock throughout. But typically, the logic pulses carried both the, the information content, it was a pulse or not, and the time information. They used short pulses, which also were the, the triggers and then the clock pulses. So using RS flip-flops instead of D flip-flops, essentially. Um, so today's technology makes it easy to build something reliable because it's all always in sync. You need to worry much about the mutual timing, et cetera. Making it simpler, you know, really, frankly, all of the last few decades of, of design thinking have made things more scalable and more easily manageable by large teams of people, et cetera. But these early designs were more or less done by a single mind, and it shows. It's all so tightly meshed and tightly interleaved and optimized. Um, I don't think there's much to be gained. Um, Andrew, we've now unmuted. Do you have anything you want to add to it? No, my question was answered. That's great. Okay. Um, yes, gentlemen of the front row. Um, now I think you've finished uh, the ACE. What's your next project? <laughs> it has turned out in a way where I have moved back in time step by step. Hmm. And I was tempted uh, by relay computers. Quite a few people have done that. So I'm, I'm not really mm -hmm. sure whether they should. Mm -hmm. that um, bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But mechanical engineering is a real challenge. <laughs> <That's true>. um, <laughs> I wanted to think about ways to implement a physical Turing engine, which, which is the wrong thing to do in a way, but I like tangible stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, maybe maybe that's uh, one of the mm -hmm. Do we have a question online? I don't think I've got any in the chat. I was just wondering. I, for the... I have one, Brian Randall. Where you go? Um, comment rather than question. First of all, thanks very much for the trip down nostalgia lane. Because, uh, I programmed Deuce for a number of years. Uh, I just wanted to comment that I am not surprised, uh, so regretted uh, that you didn't implement multiplier. Um, the point being that on the Deuce and I think the pilot ace multiplication was an amazing facility. It was asynchronous and it could be interfered with. Um, so it was the means of doing all sorts of strange things, not least converting pounds, shillings and pence to pence in a single operation, uh, because you could interfere with the operands while the uh, multiplication was going on. You could, for example, uh, count the number of bits in a word and uh, perhaps most importantly, um, it, it was capable to program a, uh, uh, the input-output conversion of um, decimal to binary uh, of a 64 column as opposed to a 32 column um, card. Uh, uh, I'm sure that that wasn't uh, why it was like that. It was really um, the, the lack of controls on the asynchronous operation. Um, but several um, very ingenious colleagues uh, discovered this 
and started exploiting it in the uh, late late 1950s. I was really tempted to implement it because of what, what you said. Right? It was such a clever combination, again, of, of dedicated hardware and software facilities, and some interesting side effects possible. And it wouldn't have been so difficult to implement, looking at the number of gates, just ran out of address space. Uh, yeah. With these 16 sources, 16 destinations, uh, I had to sacrifice something uh, and you know, the ended up being one of those. Uh -huh. That question was from Professor Brian Randall. I'm not sure whether those online uh, can actually uh, see the identities. Uh, there was a question in the room. Yes, gentlemen there. Uh, for the acoustic delay, they originally used mercury. Were they, I don't know if you discovered in your research, and you obviously use computer parts and quartz, were they considering other mediums for sound transfer, or why did they set up on mercury? You know, that they Turing himself went into surprising detail on the physics of his parts in the very initial design proposal, and he proposed mercury or alcohol, which is an alternative. <laughs> very different viscosity, but also different density, which cancelled out in many of the properties. Um, acoustic impedance, how to best couple it to the um, transducers is, is a key requirement. I'm not sure why mercury won, whether Evaporation was a problem that we're concerned about with the, the alcohol, or whether there were other downsides. Um, <laughs> maybe other losses. Um, but, uh, uh, mercury was the established technology from the radar world, and I think people just carried <clears> that up. Um, the folklore has it that um, Turing's results <coughs> show that if you were to have delay lines built out of gin, you do quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I think pretty universally, all designs which did use acoustic delay lines ended up using mercury. Yeah, that, that was the established technology coming out of the Second World War. I heard a, a Logica salesman tell me that he had worked in a previous incarnation on a mercury-based project, uh, and they were decommissioning this device, and they took took a whole load of mercury to somewhere to be recycled. I'm like, oh my God, this is one of a large percentage amount of mercury in the, in the country. I don't know how true that is, but it was quite an amazing story. Yeah, I mean, it has really fallen out of fashion today, but it, it was a, a key ingredient, key component yeah. of many functionalities, right? They can be used in switches and, and thermostats, et cetera. Um, so for the exact replica project, I did investigate the feasibility of mercury delay lines, and everyone is convinced it's health and safety arguments that put us off using them. It wasn't. It was really three factors. Um, the price of mercury. Um, we did quite significant fundraising to buy all the vacuum tubes and machines. The mercury would have cost as much again, if not more. Um, the second aspect was actually the mechanical engineering of the delay lines was quite critical to get good transmission through them. You really do have to have um, very accurately bored um, tubes and the setting up of the piezoelectric transducers is, is quite critical. Um, and the third factor that put us off from a museum perspective is on the original, they had to drain out the mercury and redistill it at regular intervals um, because of corrosion from the seals they used and interaction between the metal. And that's uh, that's clearly not feasible in a, in a museum environment. And I mean, even the National Museum is doing a bit for torsion wires instead of mercury. Yeah, that's precisely. Uh, that's the project I'm doing. The speaker is Andrew Herbert, who's leading the EDSAC project. Yeah, yeah, that made me feel better about my choice of. <laughs> uh, we are coming towards the end of our time. Are there any final questions? Can in... you put your email address back up because I've got a whole list of points which I'm not going to bore people with now. Yeah, sure, I'll, yeah. I'll do my best. Let's see. <laughs> or just give it to me. Yeah. Um, the, can, can I just say the the video of this talk uh, will be available. Uh, in the usual place on the CCS YouTube channel uh, in a few days um, and it will be available. Um, and Jorgen's email address is on the screen now, but I think that's it's not being shared. shared. Where can I reshare? Uh, can you do that? Uh, I think not. I think you need... 
to get to mm -hmm. uh, the book. Um, let me give people Jürgen's address. If you have a pencil to hand, um, it's Jürgen, J-U-E-R-G-E-N, Jürgen at E hyphen B-A-S-T-E-L-N dot D-E. Uh, yep. it, it, it's yes. yeah. It, uh, it's on the screen now, uh, in the right hand bottom corner. You'll see Jürgen Muller, uh, Hamburg. Uh, if anybody has a problem contacting that, by all means, uh, email uh, me, Roger Johnson, at the usual address that you you all know, um, and I will pass on uh, emails to Jürgen uh, for you. Um, but the, the address I think is now being displayed. Um, at that point, can I invite uh, our chairman, Chris Rees, uh, to uh, thank Jürgen for what I think has been a wonderful afternoon. Jürgen, das war wirklich ausgezeichnet. Oh, very <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. That was, that was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. We're all going to go home and start building tiny. Yes, it's and some mercury, but you know, we'll get there. We'll get there. Thank you so much. It was completely fascinating. Uh, we've all learned a lot. We've all enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much indeed. A couple of parish notices, if I may. Um, the next uh, event will be on March 21st, and David Holdsworth will be talking about Eldon II multi-access system at Leeds University. And following that, on April the 18th, Elisabetta Mori will be talking about the history of British HCI 